And Quran gives a very good phrase in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 187. The Almighty God says, Hunna le basul lakum, wa antum le basul lahunna. That they are your garments and you are the garments. That means your wives are your garments and you are the garments of your wives. What is the role of garment? The role of the garments is to beautify, to conceal, to protect. The husband and wife, they conceal each other's faults. They beautify each other. They help each other. It is the role of hand and glove. Let's discuss the rights of the mother in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, we have ordained for the human beings that they worship none but Allah and they be kind to the parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, don't say a word of contempt. Don't say off to them. But address them with honor and lower to them your wing of humility and pray to Almighty God that have mercy on them and bless them as they cherish me in childhood. Almighty God says that after worshipping Almighty God, the next point is that you have to be good to the parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, don't say oof to them and address them with honor and lower to them your wing of humility and pray to Almighty God that have mercy on them and cherish them, bless them as they cherish me in childhood. The Quran says in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 151 and Surah Ankabut chapter number 29 verse number 8 that we have enjoined the human beings to be kind to the parents. The Quran repeats the same message in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, and Surah Akaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be good to the parents. And the verse continues, especially to the mothers. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in several hadith, including a Sahih hadith of Sunnah Nisai, the book of Jihad, chapter number 6, hadith number 3106. The beloved Prophet said, Paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. That does not mean that if my mother is walking on the street and if she walks on filth and dirt, that thing becomes paradise. What the Prophet meant was when he said, Paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother means if you love your mother, if you respect your mother, if you're obedient to your mother, if you're kind to your mother, inshallah, you shall enter paradise. There's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, in volume number eight, in the book of Adab, the book of Good Manners, chapter number two, hadith number two, in the new edition of Bukhari, it's hadith number 5971, where a man approaches the Prophet and asks him that who in this world deserves the maximum love and compassion? The beloved Prophet said, it's your mother. The man asked after that too. The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. Then the Prophet said, your father. That means 75% of the love and compassion goes to your mother. 25% goes to your father. Three-fourth of the love and compassion goes to the mother and 25% of the love and compassion goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with a mere consolation prize. These are the teachings of Islam. I've got no option over it. 
let's discuss the rights of the sister in Islam. The Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 71, well, mu'minina wal mu'minat, ba'azum awliya ba'az, that the believing men and women, they are supporters unto one another. That means they socially support each other. They are like brothers and sisters unless otherwise. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad he referred to the woman as shakat. One of the meaning of the Arabic word shakat means a sister. The other meaning is one half. And we know the world population is divided approximately into equal halves of male and female. So one half is male, one half is female. And the Prophet referred to the woman as a sister. Just because the social rights in Islam the uplift the woman, what would you say? That are the women's rights in Islam, are they protected or are they subjugated? Let's discuss the educational rights of the women in Islam. The first guidance revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Almighty God, to the whole of humankind, in his last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, it was not to offer salah, it was not to give charity, it was not to fast, but it was ikra. It was to read, to proclaim, to repeat. And the first five verses revealed of the glorious Quran, was from Surah Ikra, chapter number 96, verse number 1 to 5, he says, Ikra bismi rabbika allazi khalak, khalak al insana min alak, ikra wa rabbuka al akram, alladhi alama mil kalam, alama insana ma alam yalam. Read, recite, proclaim in the name of the Lord who created. Who created the men from something which clings, a leech like substance. Read in the name of the Lord who is most bountiful. Who taught men the use of the pen. Who taught men that which he did not know. The first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, it was to read. And it was to both male and female. A beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith of Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224, the beloved Prophet said, Ta'laqul ilm faridatun ala kulli muslim. It is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman, to acquire knowledge. The Prophet specially told the parents to educate the children, especially the daughters. It is the duty of the husband to give education to their wife, especially religious education. And if they don't, she has the right to go to the court, to the judge, and demand for it. If he cannot teach it himself, He'll have to send her and see to it that he educates her. There is a chapter in Sahih Bukhari when one hadith, the woman, they approach the Prophet and they tell him that you're always surrounded by men. Why don't you give us a special time? And the Prophet agreed and he used to specially dedicate time to educate only the woman. He also sent Sahabas to specially educate the woman. And if you read the history of Islam, 1400 years ago, in the days of ignorance, in Yom al Jahiliya, at that time, we have examples of many women, several women who were scholars. The best example I can think is Aisha bint Abi Bakr. May Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet. And one of her very famous student by the name of Arawa, may Allah be pleased with her, she says that I have not come across a scholar greater than Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, in learning of the Quran, in obligatory duties, in lawful and unlawful things, in literature and poetry, in Arabic history and genealogy. And when we read the seer of Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. We find out that she lived many years after the death of the Prophet and she guided many of the Sahabas. And she even guided all the four Khulfa Rashidin. Many a time when foreign delegations came to the Prophet and when they discussed 
medicine, etc. Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, her memory was very good. She used to memorize them. She was also an expert in mathematics. And after the demise of the Prophet, many of the Sahabas came to her, especially while dealing with Mirat, while dealing with inheritance, because she was expert in mathematics. History tells us that she has taught several scholars. She has taught no less than 88 different scholars. So in short, she was a scholar of the scholars. And only on her authority alone, there are no less than 2,210 hadith reported. Only on the authority of Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Who wouldn't give up her own life for the life of her child? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Abdul Bari Yahya wishing all the viewers of Peace TV a blessed Ramadan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our deeds, our prayers and fasting, and also our zakat. This world has never seen and will never see anyone like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah chose the best of characteristics for him. In his intellect and manner, his beauty and his appearance, he was the best in everything. I am Muhammad Tim Humble. Join me to learn more about his beautiful description and his incomparable character to know your prophet. Get an in-depth description of the most popular and incomparable character in the world in Know Your Prophet, Peace Be Upon Him, tomorrow at 9 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9 a.m. India on Peace TV. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir, mother of all evils. According to the World Health Organization, every year, millions of people die due to the consumption of alcohol. My colleagues, the medical doctors, nowadays say that alcoholism is a disease. Therefore, we have to be sympathetic towards a sick alcoholic person. If alcoholism is indeed a disease, then it is the only disease that is sold in bottles. It is the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on radio broadcast stations, on television satellite channels. It is the only disease that has outlets licensed to legally spread it. It gets a revenue for the government. It is the only disease that causes violent deaths on the highways. It destroys family life and increases crime. It is the only disease that has no germs or viral cause. But our Creator, the Almighty says, in his last testament, the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansabu wal azlam, dedication of stones, divination by arrows, rich summin amli shaitan, these are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fashta nibuhu, Lallakum tuflihun. Abstain from such abomination that you may prosper. Alcoholism is not a disease. It is Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Who wouldn't 
give up her own life for the life of her child. We have the example of Umm Salma, may Allah be with her, who was the wife of the Prophet. And according to Imam Nawawi, she was the most intellectual woman amongst the learned women. And according to Ibn Hajar, he calls her as an authority. We have the example of Safiya, may Allah be with her, who was the wife of the Prophet. And Imam al Nawawi calls her as an intellectual woman. We have the example of Fatima bin Tikais, who was one of the Sabiya of Prophet. But she was so learned, and the immense knowledge she had, that once there was a discussion on the issue of fiqh, and she had a point of view, and Hazrat Aisha may Allah be pleased with her, and Hazrat Uman may Allah be pleased with him. They objected, but they could not prove her wrong. She was so knowledgeable. We have the example of Umm Salim, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the mother of Hazrat Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, who was the famous Saba. And according to Ibn Hajar, he says that she was a very intelligent woman, and Imam al Nawawi calls her as authority. We have the example of Umm Darda, who was the wife of Abu Darda, and Imam Bukhari, in his Sahih Bukhari, he calls her as an authority on the science of Hadith. We have the example of Sayyid Nafisa. Sayyid Nafisa, she was a scholar, and she taught many students. One amongst her students was Imam Shafi. May Allah have mercy on him. We also have the example of Aisha binti Saad, Ibn Abi Waqas. She too was a scholar, and amongst her students, one of the students was Imam Malik. May Allah have mercy on him. Rahim Allah. Imagine in the days of ignorance, in Yom al Jahiliya, there were several women who were scholars. At that time, people were hardly educated. And imagine, we have examples of several women who were great scholars. Let's discuss the legal rights of the women in Islam. Legally, men and women are equal. If for the crime they commit, they get the same punishment. For example, if a man kills a woman, the man is put to death. If a woman kills a man, she is put to death. According to the law of Kisas, mentioned in Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse number 170 and 179. And furthermore, if any organ of the body is damaged, irrespective whether it is the eye, the ear, the hand, irrespective whether it is of man or woman, male or female, the punishment is the same. And if suppose someone murders someone, and if the family members want to forgive by taking diya money, it doesn't make a difference who is forgiving, whether the family member is a man or a woman, both of them are equal. They have the right to forgive. The punishment for the men and women in Islam for the same crime, it is the same. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, Chop of his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone robs, irrespective whether it's a male or a female, the punishment is the same, it is the chopping of the hand. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 2, As for the fornicator, whether it's a female or a male, whether it's a woman or a man, give each hundred lashes as punishment. That means if someone does fornication, Irrespective whether it's a woman or a man, the punishment is the same, 100 lashes. In Islam, legally men and women are same. The women even have a right to be a witness. In most of the religions, women are not permitted to be a witness. Even the Jewish community, just a few decades earlier, last later, 1950, they were discussing should they give 
the woman the right to be a witness. Islam gave that right for a woman to be a witness 1400 years ago. And Quran protects the woman. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 4, that if someone lays an allegation against the chastity and modesty of a woman and does not produce four witnesses, give him 80 lashes as punishment. That means if you lay an allegation on the modesty or chastity of a woman and if you cannot produce four witnesses, you get 80 lashes. For a small crime in Islam, you produce two witnesses. For a big crime, four witnesses. That means in today's world, it is so common. Day and night, you have men and women abusing each other. You know the men, they call dirty names to the women. Many of them call them prostitute. In Islamic country, in Islamic state of law, if a man does such a thing to a woman, calls her a prostitute, and if he cannot produce four witnesses, he gets 80 lashes. And if he produces four witnesses, and if any one of them falters, all of them get 80 lashes. This is how much Islam protects the woman. I don't know in any law in the world, whether it be America, whether it be UK, whether it be Canada, whether it be India. If you take an objection, if a woman goes to the court of law and says, that man abused me, what can you do? I don't know of any case in which a woman took a man for abusing her. What punishment? In Islamic law, 80 lashes. If that law is implemented anywhere in the world, a man will think a million times before abusing a woman. This is how Islam protects the woman. And in the Western world, when a woman marries a man, she takes the name of the husband. In Islam, she has option to take husband's name or maintain her maiden name. And in many of the Islamic countries, the woman, even after marrying a man, she maintains a maiden name. Let's discuss the political rights of the women in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 71, wal mu'minat, ba'zum awliya, ba'z. The believing men and the believing women, they are supporters of one another. Not only socially, but even politically. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mumtahina, chapter verse number 12, that, O Prophet, when the women come to thee for an oath of fealty, that big word is bayan, it is far superior to the modern voting that we have. In modern voting, we select the head of state. But here, the Prophet, beside the woman agreeing that he is the head of state, they also agreed that he was the messenger of Allah, he was the Prophet of Allah. It is far superior than the modern voting system that we have today. In Islam, the woman can also take part in lawmaking. Once there was the occasion when Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, the second caliph of Islam, he was discussing with the Sahabas that should we put an upper limit for the mahar? The women, they are demanding too much money for marriage, so should we put an upper limit? So there was a woman who objected from the back seat of the mosque. Even the woman's name is not mentioned, that means it was an ordinary woman. It wasn't a woman who was a great scholar. It was an ordinary woman who objected from the back seat of the mosque and said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not put an upper limit, because the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 20, you can even give a mountain of gold. So when Allah, our creator, has not put an upper limit, who is Umar? May Allah be pleased with him to put an upper limit. And the Caliph of Islam, Hadat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, Omar is wrong and the woman is right. That means she took an objection to the breach of constitution. And this hadith is classified as a Sahih hadith. Women, there are chapters in Bukhari, who even took part in the battlefield. They went and gave water to the soldiers. They gave first aid to the soldiers, to the men. 
And there is an incident mentioned in Sahih Bukhari where a lady by the name of Nafisa during Battle of Uhud, she was amongst the other Sahabas who were around the Prophet and they protected the Prophet. And while doing that, she received wounds and the Prophet praised her for her bravery. This was in short regarding the rights of the women in Islam. But as I mentioned earlier to you, in Islam, men and women are equal. Equality does not mean identicality. Depending upon the makeup, depending upon the background, men and women, they are different. Physiologically, psychologically, biologically, physically, and depending upon the makeup, Almighty God, our Creator, has set roles for them.